just a brief summary of just to remind everybody. Oh, sorry. Is this the okay. um, where they were the parents were it was in a meth ha uh, methamphetamines and the little girl was burned is that was that was the one and then they found traces of uh, methamphetamine in her system from living in the house where they cook. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly right. So um, the little um, the little sheet. Let me get to it. Um, where you listed um, questions that you have about um, questions you would like answered. Um, so after reading the material and um, there was kind of a, a, a whole section of, of documents in between there, but um, at the beginning of chapter six, when you read the material about Kaylee Moore and how they, they took her to the hospital because she had the burns and she told the story and everything. Um, if that was your case that you were assigned to, what kind of questions come up for you that you feel like you need to have answered that you didn't get answers to in that material? I, I felt like I and this was the oh. I, I wondered who was going to no, be at the ahead. hospital with her because she was going to have to stay in the hospital for a couple of days. Who was going to be there with her um, instead of her being by herself? That was my that was actually my first thought was, is she going to be there by herself? You know, or is there going to be a family member there? Has CPS already worked that out or, you know, and then uh, my second thought was, who's the boyfriend? You know, uh, wasn't there a boyfriend in the house instead of the father uh, cooking or was that another? Uh, anyway. Yeah. And my question was, where is the father? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so who do you think would be able to answer those questions for you? Um, I thought CPS, maybe they had been thinking about, you know, that maybe they had already worked that out. Or some family members, talk to some family members or mom, maybe. So. Um, I'm not sure it would be a, a, my responsibility to, to um, inquire about the boyfriend and who he was. I, I didn't know if that was part of... Uh, and only in the context, if the little girl goes back with a boyfriend to be there. Yeah, you know, that, I didn't know what my role was in that one. Okay. So in, in, this, in this exercise, it's kind of getting you um, in the mindset of, okay, I've been handed this much information. I have questions. How do I get the information to answer my questions further? Okay. So yes, um, what you were saying about who's going to stay with the child? Um, CPS once they have made their move to remove that child from the parents, then CPS becomes the parent of that child, and so they're responsible um, for that child and for having someone there at the hospital with her. Okay. So um, you could ask that question, you know, of, of the CPS caseworker. Um, as far as the boyfriend, finding out who that is, um, you could either talk to CPS and see what efforts they've made in trying to find the uh, boyfriend, or you could talk with mom if mom is available. And I'm, I'm thinking, was mom arrested here? I'm trying to remember. I, I don't remember either. But anyway, sometimes you'll have access to mom. Sometimes you won't. Um, what about um, follow-up treatment for the child? Anybody have questions or thoughts about that? Like medically or so psychologically? Or Medically, I mean, that's the most urgent thing right now. Yeah. You know, she's, she's got some burns, all right? Yeah. That's going to require some uh, follow-up treatment. 
Um, if you have questions about that, then you can add, you can ask, CPS should know, right? But if CPS doesn't have that information, then you can get that from the medical professionals, you know, to, uh, to find out what kind of follow-up treatments she's gonna have to have. Because when they put her in a foster home, those foster parents are gonna be responsible for making sure that she gets to those um, appointments and whatever care that she's gonna need. Because I'm sure there would be some in-home care as well as doctor visits and follow-up visits, right? Okay, so um, Ka uh, Kaylee mentioned something about the house caught on fire again. Do you remember that in her story when Kaylee was telling her story? Okay, so typically one of the questions that my group will have is um, when did the house catch on fire before you know what were the circumstances of that and so I always like to let you guys know um, you can contact local uh, law enforcement and the fire department I mean you could probably call the fire department and ask for um, information about any calls to that house now it may not have been in the same place um, but you may be required, I know through law enforcement, to get law enforcement records, um, you have to file an open records request, and it's really not hard. Um, you can get a form online, uh, and you just have to be very specific in what you're asking for. For instance, if I was looking for um, records um, of police calls that had uh, been uh, answered at a certain residence involving certain people, uh, it has to have a specific time period, okay? So you, you can't just say any of them ever. You have to have a specific time period. And I would say like within the last year, has the police been called out to um, 664 uh, Meadowlark Lane um, and ask for records of those? And typically they will answer within 10 days and let you know if they can release those records and they will if there's not an ongoing investigation. They will send you copies of all the police reports um, from calls to that house, okay? And I have even had just over the phone, um, I had a case where the dad um, was, let's see, he wasn't a registered sex offender but he had been he had been arrested for some kind of sex offense in Arlington, and when I called the Arlington uh, Police Department, told them who I was, uh, the person on the other end of the phone, she just told me everything. She told me all the circumstances of his arrest, and um, a lot of times they're you know they're very willing to help you with information. So you can make those phone calls. They can say, no, we can't release, release that without an open records request. And then you can take that next step if you need to. But you can do that with the fire department, the sheriff's department, the police department as well. Okay. So that's how you can find out about that other time that the house caught on fire. Hopefully, like I said, it may be a different residence, but it may have the same names involved. So. Um, they can they can search you know not only by address but by names of the parents as well. Um, any other questions about the Kaylee Moore case? If you were going to work the Kaylee Moore case, um, what other things do you feel like you need to know that you haven't been told yet? about family members. Oh, I, that's, I was remember, wondering, family members, does she have any other family members besides, on mom or dad's side of the family? Um, has she ever had to live with them before? Kind of things yeah. like that. Um, I guess she's not in school yet, but does she go to like a, well, probably not a daycare or anything, but. Um, probably not. So, who's yeah. in and out of the house? <laughs> That's, that's exactly right. Um, it, CPS will have very limited information usually that they've gotten from mom. And I think I told you before, moms and dads are not always willing to share contact information for family members. Um, but 
you can talk to Kaylee. You mm-hmm. can ask Kaylee. She's old enough to know who's grandma and uh, does she have, you know, when, when she goes to somebody's house for holidays, who's there and just start making notes of who she's talking about and um, names that she mentions. She may not be able to tell you where they live, but at least if you have names, then you can go uh, to the caseworker and say, hey, Kaylee mentioned somebody named Mike or uh, Kaylee says she has a grandma. Um, and uh, you can also talk to mom if you have access to mom and ask her about those. The more specific you can be, the more information you're gonna get from that parent, okay? So remember that we don't want Kaylee to go to foster care if we can find a relative that she can go and live with. So that needs to be a a top priority is finding out who is it in her family that she has a connection to, okay? And um, start trying to find those people. Um, You can also Facebook, uh, if the mom has a Facebook page and you can access her friends, um, you might find those relatives, you might find the names uh, there and be able to make contact with them that way. So you just got to get creative and, and try to think of any way that you can to track down who this child's family is so we can try to get her with family instead of in foster care. <laughs> Okay, so also with that, um, so it also I mentioned that she uh, might have been um, part of part Native American, so they were going to try and place her with foster care or with the foster family that was Native American. Um, wouldn't we have to find out, you know, if they had already contacted or if they were trying to get with the tribe to see or uh, whatever tribe it is? That actually is the responsibility of CPS. Once, if if someone uh, mentions to you, someone in the family mentions to you that there's some Native American heritage, you need to let CPS know that um, so that they can follow up. Um, excuse me, I just said that. Um, but that's their responsibility is to find out who that tribe is and notify them. Uh, So in this situation, we don't have any verification that she has Native American heritage, but it's, and so it doesn't stop the process at all until they can confirm it. Um, So CPS will start working on that. uh, And you don't have to do anything with regard to the Native American um, heritage. Okay. And as far as the placement and stuff, that only comes into play if they confirm that she has, she is a registered Native American. Okay. Good question. All right. Any other questions or thoughts about um, the Kaylee Moore case? And there's a whole lot of other um, uh, worksheets on the Kaylee Moore case. It's kind of what we're doing though. Uh, interview questions for the caseworker and the mother. We kind of talked about all of those, but um, you know, if you just it, just be sure and look over the material, um, it's just to help you figure out where to start. You know, how do I start investigating my my case? And this is a good example of uh, what your questions are, where you get the information, how to record the information, and how to prioritize the things that you do. Okay. All right, so um, let's talk a little bit about the Lavender Bass case, which you're going to do your court report on. Um, I don't know if any of you have started on your court report. Has anybody read the Lavender Bass case yet? It's chapter eight in your training manual. Okay, and I see Donna says she has. Anybody else? No? Okay. All right. So one of the things um, that's going to be important on the Lavender Bass case, we just talked about. Um, Lavender is a member of a Native American tribe. Okay. And uh, that is not um, completely apparent uh, 
um, at the beginning of the case when you get your first information. But as you do that in there, there are going to be interviews with the different people involved in the case, the caseworker. Um, there's a, an aunt and a grandmother, I think, that live with her, uh, mom, dad, the CASA volunteer. Okay, so through talking with these people, through these, um, these written interviews that are in your training manual, you're going to gather bits and pieces of information um, about her family. Um, you talk to the foster mom as well about how she's doing in foster care and she's not doing well. I'll tell you, spoiler alert, she's not doing well in foster care, but it's kind of up to you, right? To kind of uh, sluice out what, what does this child need? Okay, because you're gonna be making recommendations about what needs to happen to her, what's in her best interest. And it's through these interviews with these other folks involved in the case um that you're going to figure out what are the best recommendations for this child um we used to do this when we do it live we break into groups and uh, i give you the case information okay and then your group decides who do we want to talk to first and then i give them the interviews with the people they want to talk to one of those people that i that i mentioned um, if you don't interview everybody in that case, and this often happened, um, you won't have the complete picture. So when the groups would do like their recommendations for their court report, that was the goal was read the information, do interviews, and then make recommendations um, for what's going to be best for this child. And the ones who had not done enough interviews had recommendations that were completely um, not in the best interest of this child. Uh, so it's really, it really brings home the point. You have to talk to everybody. You have to get information from every possible source that you can access to be able to get a whole picture. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. And if you don't have all of the pieces, you're not gonna be able to see what that picture is. And so the Lavender Bass case does an excellent job of that. You guys will probably read all of the interviews, or I hope you will. I hope you'll read all the interviews and get all the information before you do your court report. But um, it really is interesting when you do it live and you have a time limit. Uh, that's the other thing. You only have a certain amount of time to do your research and make your recommendations. And if you leave out somebody's interview, you miss a piece of information that's really critical to what this child needs. So I hope you guys will um, enjoy uh, working that case, at least on paper. Um, sorry that it has to be by yourselves, but um, I, I think it's very crucial to learning. Don't, don't dismiss one person in the case because that may be the one person that has that piece of information you really need. Okay, so any questions about homework assignments? I don't know if I remember or not, but is there, um, there is probably a template in our a booklet here of how to do our court report. Um, is that, you should have, well, you should have received the actual court report form via email for the Lavender Bass case. Remember on the Harris Price case we sent you one? Okay. It's just like that, and except it's for Lavender Bass. Did you receive that? I, I, it would have been an attachment. Who needs it? I don't, I don't think I did. Let me look and see. Um, I'll resend if anybody needs it. Okay. Is that all we were supposed to get for yes or Tuesday? Because I only got the court report. I didn't get anything about videos or anything we we're supposed to watch. And I didn't get the I didn't get court report for the lavender bass. Hey, Tina. Hang tight, y'all. Got a phone call. Hold on. Yeah, 
yeah, Tina, uh, Tina will be sending that. Um, and also the interviews that you're supposed to watch, those are going to be on the um, Casa of Hill County, Texas YouTube channel. Okay. So it's the same place where you watch Naomi. Um, there are video interviews on there with uh, the judge, the attorney for CES, um, the attorney that does parents and children. Her name is DeAndrea Petty. There's a CASA volunteer. Um, Gina Promise is, uh, uh, interview is on there. And it seems like there may have been one more. Um, those interviews are on that YouTube channel, the same place where you go to watch the training if you missed it, and where you watched uh, the Naomi video. Okay, I sent it to Donna again. I said she was on the original email, but I just sent it to you again. Does anybody else need it? Can you go ahead and send it to me as well? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay, I have kind of a little bit of a random question about the Lavender Bass case. Um, okay. So on the interview with the CPS worker, um, in the little description thing, it says that the paternal grandmother um, admittedly had said that she did not want anybody to contact her, like, because she didn't want to be dragged into the case. So when somebody says that, what is, like, how do we perceive that and deal with that? Because if they know information and it could be important information, how do we perceive that on trying to get the information we need? Um, they don't have to talk to you. Um, I'll just tell you that. Usually in those situations where uh, somebody says, I don't want to be involved in the case, it's not that they don't want to share information with you. It's that they don't want to take the child. They don't want to deal with the parents. Um, so sometimes they are willing to talk to you and answer questions, um, but they're not going to be a, a possible placement for that child. So uh, you can just, if, if you get their contact information, if it was me and I said, I don't want to be involved, I wouldn't give them my phone number. But if you can get their phone number, you can call. And, and because well, remember, oh, Don, what were you going to say? <laughs> well, I'm going to say anything, I guess. So, yes, um, sorry, guys. Sorry. A little yeah. coughing spell here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you can you can see if they want it if they you know just let them know who you are and uh, what your role is and then ask them if they would be willing to just share some information with you you're not asking them to do anything other than just share some information Okay, um, we're going to send you the um, assignment checklist and it will have every assignment that you were asked to do during the training from the, watch the Emily's Dragon video all the way through the Lavender Bass Court Report, um, just as a help for you to be able to check off, yes, I did this one, yes, I did that, and then you'll say, oh, I don't even know what that is, and then you can go back and uh, make sure that you have gotten everything. Um, so we'll send you that checklist today so that you can be working on that. Tina's resending the court report form for the Bass case. If you didn't get that, be sure you watch those interview videos. Um, and once you have all of that uh, checklist completed, then um, I think you've got everything that you need aside from your fingerprints, if you haven't done that yet. And then the staff will be letting you know about um, a schedule to get sworn in. So I'll let Don um, talk to y'all a little bit about that and what the next steps are. So um, once we have completed this and sort of taken a look at all the homework, I, well, 
I'll be contacting the judge to try and set up a um, swearing in. So far this year, all of our swearing in since COVID have been virtual. I'll ask him since he is now doing court in person, he may want to do the swearing in in person also. So I will find out and then let you know, you know, some possible dates and times uh, where we can do that, um, get that swearing in done. But it does kind of depend on the judge's schedule um, <clears throat> more than anything else. I think there's also um, several in the class who have not done the courtroom observation yet. Um, Don, if you want to talk to them about court, court dates and how all of that, you know, how they can get that done. Sure. Um, we have court uh, next week on Thursday. And so um, hopefully if you're available, you can come by and, and see that court. Um, <clears throat> we are kind of um, doing things a little bit differently during COVID. You know, um, for a while there, it was pretty easy because he was recording his court sessions. And so we could, you could, you know, you had like a 24 hour period where you could do it. But now you do have to be in court. So you will have to come by on a Thursday. Remember, our courts are every other Thursday. So we don't have one today, but we will have one next week. And then there will be one two weeks after that that you can um, go and get your courtroom observation in. And so while we may go ahead and do the swearing in prior to observing court, we certainly will not assign anybody to a case until you've completed um, all, of, all of those um, requirements. So, and we do have cases for you to take, so. <clears throat> yes, we do. I just really, yes, I just wanted to say that uh, I lost my train of thought that um, I forget me. I'm serious. I literally lost my train of thought, y'all. It had to do with courtroom. Oh, I know. I have to have I, everybody's done really well on homework. I have to have a court report from you guys. OK, that is one of the things you have to have in your folder okay is a completed court report from you so that is of the utmost importance you guys have done phenomenally on homework i said seriously about turning it in you know all of that i said i've seen i said don will look over it too but i said i've seen it's the court report from everybody that i still need Yeah, um, you guys, that that is the most crucial part of your training is learning to do the court report because remember, that is your most direct tool to communicate with the judge and the attorneys. You cannot talk to the judge about your case, okay? This is the way you get to talk to him and you get to share information with him. Um, it's critical that you get that um, to get that down not not just writing the court report but being able to send it back and forth because all of this stuff has deadlines you understand there are court hearings that have to happen on certain dates and those court reports have to be filed prior to those hearing dates so we can't take the time to learn how to do it when you have a hearing coming up in 10 days and that's why it's so important for you to do this during training. Let's, let's get those court report forms sent back and forth. Let's get the information in there. Even if it's, you know, if you don't, you're not good, you're not gonna be good at writing a court report at this point. But what is important is that you're familiar with the form, you know how to get it back and forth to your supervisor and you understand the importance of it. And so that's why we do two of them during the training. At the beginning, we do the Harris Fries. At the end, we do the Lavender Bass. It's the most important thing that you do during training. So yeah, and if you need help with that, oh my gosh, there's so much help available. Tina can help you. Krista can help you. 
Don can help you. Uh, there's there's information in your training manual about what to put in there. You know, I know you feel like I don't know what to say. Um, there's tips in there about court report writing and what's important. And when you watch that interview with the judge, he will tell you, I read those court reports. Uh, I had a judge in Johnson County, um, and you'll get familiar with this when you uh, get your first case. CPS does a court report and it's like 23 pages long. And it's got a whole lot of stuff that's repeated over and over again. It's just, it's agony to have to read that court report from CPS. And so the judge said, I want to read the, the CASA court report because it's three pages long. I know exactly where the information I'm looking for is going to be located in that court report. And so I that's what I go to first. All right. That's huge, guys. That is a huge part of what the judge is using. Uh, when he's making his decisions about what happens to these kids. So I cannot stress how important it is to you. Um, so get comfortable with it. I know you're not comfortable with it. Nobody is. But get comfortable with it before you get your first case because it's going to be a great tool for you. Okay, Don, I think that's all I have. Okay, so um, thank you all for toughing this out. Um, I know it's kind of hard, especially with uh, the virtual training, the fact that you're not in the same room with your you know, fellow advocates, but um, you have you, uh, you just about crossed the finish line here. So if you can get those court reports into us, so we have something for your file, uh, to document that, um, yes, they did do the training and yes, they did complete all this stuff. Like I said, I will be contacting the judge to come up with a swearing in date and a methodology. And I'll let you know if it's going to be in person or um, by Zoom. Um, with that, uh, I think we are done, folks. You know, you can move your tassels over, right? <laughs> so, uh, so this is sort of graduating season, yes. Throw your cap in the air. Um, so we have uh, completed the class. So. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. And I, I look forward to a time when we can be together. Maybe now that we have court in person, you know, you'll you'll get to see CASA volunteers at court. So you may not know them, but um, there yeah. will be multiple cases scheduled at the same time. And so there will be yeah. CASA volunteers that you can meet and get to know. And hopefully I'll run into you guys along the way. So yeah, I look forward can to I that. Just I just want to invite everybody. I said we have an event that we're about to begin again called Coffee with Casa. And I said, even if you don't have court that day and you just want to come to the office, you will get an email saying that you're invited. They start at eight o'clock on the Thursdays that we have court. I said the attorneys are invited. CPS is invited. You're invited. The board will be invited. Everybody. And if you guys just want to come and check in at the office, you know, talk to a supervisor for a few minutes or, you know, meet some other people who are all part of this process. You are welcome and you will be notified like the Monday before court. OK, so even if you don't have court that day and you're just in Hillsborough, stop by and say hi. Can I ask right quick, are, when you email us, are you emailing us to the CASA email or to our original one that you gave us? We will switch I mean, from now on, everything will come on your CASA email. Okay, okay. Because yes. I have been looking on my Yahoo and maybe that's why I haven't been able to find things, so. No, not yet. I'm not sending anything okay. yet to your okay. CASA account. I said, somebody got something from me today, okay? okay. But this is the first one. I haven't even you know accessed those for y'all yet. So y'all will get one from me soon. Okay. I, uh, can you hear me? Okay, yes. will you tell her to give me one? I, I haven't okay. gotten any info on my CASA email. You won't. You okay. will from well, now on. No, 
I don't have like a login or anything yet. Okay. Don. Okay. Um, yes, you do. Um, okay. And the logins for all of the CASA email accounts for the first time is CASA with a capital C, the number four, and kids. K I D S. <clears throat> <clears throat> the first time you log in, it's going to ask you to change your password. So then you can set it to be something you want it to be. And if you need, if for some reason you can't get into it, let me know and I can reset the passwords. And um, that I'll let him know as soon as I do get them. So is it, is our first, first initial last name? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And then it's just going to ask me to change my password. First initial last name for everybody. So far we haven't had had to duplicate where we've had a first initial and last name the same. <clears throat> and Except you for those wrongs, email at some point on your um, personal email account and it would have come from Microsoft. It wouldn't come from us. It'll come from Microsoft saying you've got an account that's been set up. And you might check the junk mail, make sure it didn't go there. And Tina, if I understand correctly, you're sending their assignments to the training email, yes? Well, I'm sending their assignments to their personal emails. And I said they're sending their assignments back to the training email. Yes. Okay. Nothing's gone to the CASA email except what I sent to Megan a few minutes ago, the Bass Court Report, but I put her personal email on it too. Because when I saw it, I'm like, oh, those are up. Yay. So I went ahead and sent it to that too. But that's the only thing that's been sent to a CASA email. Everything has been to their personal. I do my best um, court reports in my CASA email now. So I'll get, get that, Dana. I'm sorry, say that one more time. Um, I just opened my CASA email and my BAS reports are in my CASA email. So I just wanted to let you know I got it. Good. Okay, good. Hey guys, it's Krista. Um, sorry, my children are in the car with me, so I hope it's not super loud. Um, can y'all hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Have y'all talked about um, helping them get their cost of emails on their phone if they want to do that, or how often they need to be checking their cost of email, even prior to getting a case? Um, have y'all talked about you just muted nope you're it but um if you will remember when when we originally talked about the optimal training and set up your email i mentioned to everybody that if you need help getting these things set up then just let us know you can come up here you can bring your phone you can bring your computer um if it's absolutely necessary, I'll even come to your house to get you set up on um, <laughs> on on your um, communication so that you can have it available. A lot of us do it on our phones because it's yes, we will the way to keep it with you all the time and and check it no matter what. And so we certainly can help you get that set up. I have um, actually done them both on iPhone and Android. Um, so I'm a little more familiar with Android than iPhone, but I can do both. So just, um, you know, let us know. We'd be happy to help. And also, it's not just about you being able to check it on the go, but for you to get notifications. Because a lot of people, times I'll email. And a couple of days later, I'll text them and say, hey, did you get my email? And they hadn't checked their CASA email and they didn't get notification of uh, um, 
So that's another thing. It's just either you need to check it regularly or set it up or you'll get notified. <coughs> So she had, uh, Krista was kind of cutting out a little bit there, but, and that's, and that's the thing, this information will come to you um, at various times. And so um, those of us who sort of live in that world, we're always seeing it, but you're liable to get emails late at night. Um, we got one email this morning at 6.30 from the, um, from the attorney for the department, so, or at least I did, not everybody else, but, um, so if you were on that case, you would have gotten that email very early this morning, so. <clears throat> All right, anything else from anybody? Okay. No, I'm going. I think I'm going to see Michaela and Megan on Thursday on this next Thursday, right, girls? Okay. All right, and then I said we'll see Sarah at the next one. Okay, so everybody's committed. Okay, over when they're coming to court. Okay, well that's great. All right, once again, thank you guys. So we'll be looking forward to seeing. Hey, Don. Uh, short, yes. Go ahead, Chris. Did we tell them about Chad and Chu? Oh, thank you. Um, we probably ought to make a list of all the things we want to make sure that we cover administratively with, with, administratively with everybody. Um, on the first Friday of every month, we have what's called Chat and Chew. And so far, that has been virtual. Um, we may try to do a hybrid version of that. <clears throat> um, I don't really like hybrid, hybrid versions very well simply because uh, sometimes the communication devices, microphones and other things don't pick up well when you try to do a hybrid. But if we can get one that actually will do well for everybody that is on Zoom, uh, then we may try and do this as a hybrid, but certainly we will be having meetings here where you'll be invited to come in. We will do trainings in the chat and choose where uh, we may have a very short training on, we did one uh, at one point on um, ARDS and 504 meetings. And so uh, for individuals who don't live in that world, it's very helpful to kind of hear the terminology and understand what's going on. We do have um, um, two of our advocates that are um, professionals in that area. Um, they were uh, involved in um, special education and therefore they were very well versed in what the laws are, what the requirements are, what school districts are required to do and while a lot of school districts are very proactive in that sort of stuff, um, some are not. And so it's nice to have that sort of a resource and that kind of training. So we'll be doing other things like that. We also have chat and choose where we just talk about our cases. And so you'll have the opportunity to um, visit with uh, other folks to say, here's a problem I'm having with my case, or here's a question I have on my case. You know, what do you guys think? What kind of help can we get? And you'd be surprised at the um, resources that are available relative to the advocates that are part of our organization. Um, you guys are now a part of, uh, I don't know the exact number, 35 or 36 um, active volunteers, and they run the gamut, you know, from uh, teachers to retired business people to pastors to even um, former attorneys. So um, we, we have a lot, of, a lot of resources there that can help you uh, if you need it. And, and so in our chat and choose, the first Wednesday 
of every month, uh, first Wednesday, sorry, the first Friday of every month. Friday. So don't, don't be shaking your head at me, Rebecca. You know, I'm old. What can I say? <laughs> so again, first Friday of every month at noon. And uh, we stole this from Ellis County. And Rebecca's actually probably one of the ones that set this up and did it a lot when she was the supervisor in Ellis County. Um, and about the time we got our started, COVID hit. And so we have been doing them virtually, um, but, and we'll, we'll see how that works out if we can do them as a, as a blended model. All right, Krista, what else do I need to tell them? You've been my reminder person today. All right. Well, with that being said, ladies, thank you so much. We will be um, talking with you soon about the swearing in ceremony and then your first case. Thank you. All right. Bye.